in the very early days of film, everything was done with analog optical, both the original pre-mixing and the original recording, because there was no magnetic in the, in the 30s. By the time I got involved in, uh, in started taking interest in the late 60s, early 70s, the technique was to record location stuff on quarter-inch tape, analog, and nagra, and then uh, a multitude of premixes and music would be recorded on tape and then 35 mil magnetic, what we call full coat, which is 35 millimeter sprocketed film but with oxide all the way across. And a lot of tracks would be mixed together and copied doing premixes like a fir tree until finally a master would get copied onto an analog optical negative, which then in turn would get printed onto the release prints in the theaters. Now the, the problem with the, the sound quality dates back to the 30s when in the 30s power was expensive and wood was cheap. As a result the loudspeakers were made to be very efficient in order to save power because vacuum tubes were unbelievably expensive. You know 15 watts was considered to be a big power amp in those days so the speakers had to be really efficient and as a result they didn't sound too good. You would get a characteristic that looked, I refer to it as the paramount trademark. It was like two mountains like this a high frequency unit and a low frequency unit, very, very warped. And uh, the mixers would try and compensate for this bad loudspeaker system, stuck behind a screen as best they could, which meant they would raise the highs up significantly on the console to try and compensate for the drooping high frequency response coming from the loudspeaker. And uh, that raising of the highs meant there was a lot of distortion on the magnetic elements before you get to the film. So you finish up with high noise because of the number of generations, high distortion, and then you finish up on a loudspeaker that's of very poor quality in terms of today's standards. So to get film sound to improve was a lot more than just adding noise reduction. You had to grapple with this issue of how the whole process was working. That was a, a lengthy program for us, going f lasted three, four, five years really before we managed to get people to first of all start using equalizers. We, that was the first product we built at Dolby that was not just noise reduction, it was a third octave equalizer to, to try and straighten out the loudspeaker response. Luckily because the loudspeaker was so efficient there was, there was the capability of equalizing it. If the loudspeaker had been less efficient it might have been more difficult to equalize it out. So we discovered that even these rather primitive uh, multicellular horns could be equalized to get them to sound much better, much flatter. As you flatten out the loudspeaker, uh, less equalization is required in the mix. So as a result, there is a lower distortion. But by token of the fact that you're raising the highs on the loudspeaker to get a better frequency response, up comes the hiss, so noise reduction becomes the key that makes the whole package possible. First of all, golden rule number one was not to mess around with the analog SR optical because that sounded so good. And the, the nature of film sound is that you can only release one type of print. Uh, because the way prints fall through from one screen to another in a complex and then goes from a first release house to a second release house, the distributors will have nothing to do in the long run with, with uh, prints that will only run in certain theatres. So that analog soundtrack had to always be there in order to ensure single inventory as they call it. So we had to put digital data somewhere else on the film. So the first question was where? And uh, the nicest idea we thought would be to put the digital data in a horizontal strip between the frames. You know, there's 24 frames a second. And betwe between each frame, on a, on a normal widescreen picture, there is a little black strip, which is about, I um, think, an eighth of an inch high. Good thing about it is that as the film comes through the picture gate, it slows down and stops for each particular flash of the shutter. And that would give you a chance to scan the data quite easily. The problem, though, would be that for cinemascope films, there is no frame line. So for 20% of the films, we'd actually have to change the shape of the picture to use that area. So we decided that was too much of a challenge to take on. So then we had to evaluate other areas on the film that might be viable. So to do that, we put a length of uh, black leader in films around the country, and I think at about 20 different theaters, including New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, um, between the trailers and the feature, and let the film run for 100 plays, 200 plays, 300 plays, which is a pretty long run, and I think in one theater we ran some stuff for 1,000 plays. Got those pieces of black leader back, 
use it to evaluate where there was the minimum print wear in, in the remaining space, which is between the sprockets and outside the sprocket holes. And not only where the print wear was less, but also to determine the shape and orientation of typical dirt. Does the dirt lie along the film, or is it on a random basis? Is the dirt got, is it square or is it long? Is it hairs or is it dust? In order to determine whether, what size the bits should be, um, where the best place to put the bits is, whether the bits should be oblong, oblong. There's a school of thought that the bits should have been slightly more rectangular in order to protect against movement that's dragging things down the film. And then finally determine that the best space to place to put the data was between the sprocket holes, which to many people seems like crazy, but it actually is pretty low print wear, and that the bits should be square. And then the final trade-off is the bit size versus the amount of compression you have to use. You could have very small bits and very low compression with a very high data rate, but you would suffer from print wear. And then you'd start losing bits and have more problems with, uh, with uh, failing data. For instance, on a magnetic tape, if you have a bit stream, you review the bits in order as a pulse train comes off. The competitive systems on digital sound on film have a pulse train. Uh, we do it a different way. We actually look, on with, essentially with a video camera, at the block that's on in between the sprocket holes and determine where the four corners are with these little marks that are in each corner called Barker code marks. That enables us to build up a two-dimensional matrix of where the bits should be in that, in that square, in that particular block. And then look at each individual point where a bit should be to determine whether it's a black or a white, uh, or a plus or a minus. And only then, having done that recovery and correction, string out a pulse train. So by doing that video analysis before you ever try and come up with a pulse train, you do a lot of error correction and restoration uh, much more effectively than you ever could do if you try and instantly read it out as a pulse train. That makes the system extremely rugged. And a couple of other th uh, things we did that, that are improvements over conventional digital technology that are uniquely applied to film. One is called uh, um, splice caching. We discovered that, that most of the problems you get reading digital data off the film happens at the end of the 2,000 foot reels, the splices. And the reason for this is that the operator will glue the two reels together, they get dust and dirt. The splice tape itself will cause problems with the digital data. Um, so we discovered that the biggest problems we had were always with the two or three feet at the end of the reel. So we have some blocks that are what we call bogus blocks, dummy blocks, during the course of the reel. And we replicated the data that comes up in that final two feet through the course of the reel. And so that's built up into a buffer as the reel goes through. And if you get to the end of the reel and there's a missing block, you look it up in this other register and here's the block to replace it with. And another thing we actually have is that uh, what we call dynamic loading is that we also use those bogus blocks to carry the latest revision of software for the theater unit. So that beginning of reel one of the movie, the version of software that's on the film is compared with the version that's actually in the processor in the cinema. If the version on the film is more up to date than the one in the processor, you revert to analog for a very short time, beginning of the reel, reload a totally new software operating system into flash ROM and switch it over so that the theater is updated automatically without even knowing it. This is akin to driving into the gas station, load your car up with gas and discover you've got a new set of tires as you drive out without even knowing it. You know, it's, that's a pretty nice operation. So it gives us a chance to update without having to force theaters into buying or installing new hardware. That, that's a very attractive thing because it's, it's a technology that's constantly on the move. And I guess we've done three dynamic loads in the last uh, few years, the way we've, we've put in new versions of software. And they gradually spread around the theaters. It's, it's, you watch them migrating the latest version.